Some days I develop a sneaking suspicion that the younger generations are struggling with motivation when I check in on social media and the news. I catch a report that members of the millennial generation are more likely to still be living with their parents compared to Generation X was at the same age, or just see someone tweeting about the injustice of overwhelming student loans, and it reminds me that I am definitely from an earlier generation. By far and away, the most telling thing that I see happens when a 20-something posts a message about how their generation faces a more difficult future than previous generations, and then calls anyone who rejects this notion a boomer. Boomer, as in baby boomer, the generation before their parents. Most boomers are reaching retirement age or have already retired. In short, boomer is the modern, less overtly offensive way to call someone old. Quite a dismissive, condescending tone to take with your parents' generation. Don't be surprised when someone in that generation responds in the same tone. Now this video isn't speaking to all of the millennials out there who are doing what they are supposed to be doing. The silent majority who have put in the work without complaint and earned their place in the world have my respect. These millennials are adulting, just the way that we old people had to do when we were their age. And they have my deep respect. No, this video is about the bell-end millennials, the snowflakes if you will. Those of you that linger on the fringes of the sociopolitical spectrum and bitch endlessly about problems which are either not that significant, not actually problems at all, or problems effectively of your own making. You aren't adulting at all, although you complain about how hard it is to adult because what you act like is a bunch of kids. You were the ones who put all of your personal business onto social media as if the rest of the world needed to know all about it. Remember, if you want to toss about veiled insults when someone offers you advice on how to solve those globally published problems, then brace yourself for some roasted opinions, because I'm tired of listening to you whine. Let's start with the number one problem for millennials, as reported by Business Insider in February of 2018, climate change. Oh no, climate change. It's global. We don't know what will happen. 97.9% .9 of scientists agree that global climate change is happening and that we have to stop it. The world is going to end. We're all going to die. And it's all the fault of the boomers for creating it and not fixing it when it was discovered especially Americans who just don't care about Mother Earth. Okay, people, breathe. Global climate is an extremely complex system. So complex, in fact, that predicting the local weather more than three days in advance is difficult. Predicting weather a week in advance is guessing. Don't believe me? Ask a meteorologist. Since that is true, what makes you think that meteorologists and climatologists can truly predict what will happen 10 years from now. Yes, the climate has changed. It does that. It's a dynamic system. In 1850, we were beginning to come out of the Little Ice Age, which lasted for 500 years before that. And before the Little Ice Age was the medieval warming period. Before that, it was cold. Before that, it was warm. And before that, are you sensing a pattern here? Climatologically speaking, we are in a period of intermittent ice ages in this epoch. The world has been much, much warmer in the past, and much, much colder. Can we stop climate change? Probably not. Can we survive it? Probably so. Can we practice better stewardship of the planet by reducing our footprint? Absolutely. The number two problem cited? War. War is bad. War is evil. War is theft written on a global scale. War is the product of rampant imperialism, and there is no more imperialistic country in the world than the United States. Okay, people. Breathe. Wars happen sometimes. They are usually preventable, but not always. You philosophy majors should recognize Thomas Aquinas from Introduction to Philosophy class. He was the philosopher who expounded on the concept of just war a necessary evil to defend a good cause against the creeping doom of injustice and tyranny. Sometimes, war is necessary to defend the people and their way of life. 
Sometimes it's necessary to remove a tyrant from power before he gets more of his own people killed. That's what we did in World War II, remember? The United States actually has a better track record over the course of its history in regards to fighting wars for just causes than, say, European countries, or Asian countries, or even South American countries. America isn't perfect in this regard by any stretch of the imagination, nor is any other nation in the world. As for American imperialism, I ask you, how many times has America given back conquered nations to their people in the last century or so? Maybe America was imperialist in the past, but it's been a very long time since that era. America first has never meant America only. The number three problem? Inequality. Are you kidding? We live in current year. Inequality shouldn't exist anymore. Martin Luther King and Malcolm X died for equality 50 years ago, and it's worse than ever, especially in the United States. Okay, people. Breathe. We've passed many laws in the last decade or two to eliminate discrimination. They built on laws passed in the last 50 years or so to eliminate discrimination. Those laws build on constitutional amendments passed after the Civil War more than a century and a half ago to eliminate discrimination. But laws don't eliminate conduct. They simply make it illegal so that harsher consequences attach to it. Passing more laws still won't eliminate bigotry. People enforcing the laws on the books will reduce it, though, but we have to stop feeding the monster. The ideal situation is for these differences to be respected, right? How better can we respect them than to disregard them when they don't have any bearing on the situation? How about we don't mention our differences constantly, over and over again, as if being born with a certain skin color or raised in a certain family or being attracted to a certain group of people matters in the least as to how we should be treated when obtaining a driver's license or ordering a hamburger or casting a ballot. The number four problem? Poverty, especially child poverty. OMG, no child should live in poverty. America is the richest nation in the world. We need to eradicate poverty, especially when the rich are simply getting richer by robbing the poor. Okay, people, breathe. Yes, poverty is bad. Children growing up in poverty is tough. I should know. I grew up in poverty. May I point out a couple of things, though? First, poverty in America is determined by the poverty line, a calculated value based on the cost of a minimum food diet in 1963, adjusted for inflation and family size. It's calculated that way because of eligibility for government benefits. And strangely enough, most jobs in food production and processing are low-wage jobs to try to keep the cost of food down. We should work to increase income so that fewer people live in poverty, if for no other reason than to decrease the number of people who are dependent on government programs for survival. But we can't just pass a law to eliminate poverty. Second, poverty in America is nothing compared to poverty elsewhere. Even in utopian Europe, land of social programs galore, there are still people living in poverty, and poverty in those countries is often more profound than poverty found in America. It's a function of their per capita income, and there aren't that many countries in the world that have a higher per capita income than the United States. Outside of the Western world, poverty reaches epic proportions, and still the population keeps on rising in those areas fast enough to propagate still more poverty and provide an endless stream of immigrants coming to the Western nations looking for a better life. It's even mentioned in the New Testament of the Bible. The poor will always be with you. You want to eliminate poverty? Good. Start your own business and create good-paying jobs. You want to mitigate problems associated with living in poverty? Good. Get busy. Volunteer. Help out. The number five problem? Religious conflict. Are you kidding me? All belief systems are equally dumb. Why are people fighting over gods and deities when anyone with a brain knows that God not real? We need to remove all references to any superstition from all public areas in order to separate the church from the state and finally be free from religion in America. Okay, people. Breathe. Is anyone really forcing their religion on you? I know that they're practicing their religion in your presence sometimes, but are they forcing you to agree with them? Is your personal system of beliefs that someone praying to a god you do not worship in your presence is an affront to you on par with being burned at the stake for heresy? 
Many people still hold some religious beliefs, and yes, some of those religious beliefs are evangelical in nature. If they are actually preventing you personally from carrying out the business of daily living while they proselytize, then by all means, notify the cops. If you can ignore them and carry on, then keep calm and carry on. Oh, and if you're in the group of those in-your-face purveyors of religion or the lack thereof, Please remember that you gain nothing by forcing your beliefs upon others. Rather, the opposite effect results from this. You will convince more people to consider your beliefs if you stop telling them that they are evil for not sharing them. No one likes to be called evil, and realizing that one has personal faults and flaws is a deeply introspective thing. If you give someone a reason to blame you, then they will nearly always point out your errors rather than considering their own. The number six problem, corruption and government accountability. Oh, that's so true. The government doesn't want us to find out just how corrupt they are, especially the president of the United States who is profiting off of his office. Orange man bad. Orange man bad. Okay, people. Breathe. Power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's why we have a system of government in the Western world designed to limit power and peacefully transfer power from one elected official to his or her successor. Donald Trump may be reviled, but let me tell you a secret. The Washington establishment hates him more than you do. He may be a bombastic presence, but he's ripping the facade of respectability off of the government and exposing the corruption beneath. If you want to vote him out of office for being corrupt or whatever reason you feel is appropriate, then you might want to take a look at everyone else in Washington, because there are very few there who aren't corrupt, and there is no one in Washington who has no personal agenda. Every last one of those elected and appointed officials decided to seek their high offices. Remember? I personally agree with Mark Twain, who said that politicians and diapers should both be changed often and for the same reason. I also agree with Harry Truman, though I am a conservative and he wasn't, that no elected official gets rich on merely a government salary. A concerning thought considering that the most wealthy district in the nation is a suburb of Washington, D.C., filled with elected officials, appointed officials, their staffers, and a not inconsequential amount of lobbyists. The number seven problem, food and water security. I know, right? With global climate change, we know that food will become scarce. People are already starving. Not even water is secure anymore. Look at what's happening in Flint, Michigan. It's not just a third world problem. Okay, people. Breathe. World food production levels are still rising. So much so that farmers are having trouble making a living without government subsidies. There are foreign governments, large foreign governments, that are currently refusing to purchase food commodities. The real problem isn't a lack of food. It's sustainable farming practices, which in America aren't as profitable so long as the government keeps buying up those surpluses. By the way, those surpluses typically become the principal method of providing aid to foreign countries, especially in the third world. As for water supplies, well, to use the example that I cited earlier, Flint has now been given enough money to replace every inch of pipe in the city, from the source to the faucet and back, even going so far as to provide money to tap into different sources to get the lead out of their water supply. Honestly, if Flint is going to get the lead out of their water, then they need to start by getting the lead out of their city hall. Ditto everywhere else that's received millions of dollars to fix a problem and hasn't even started. Or worse, diverted the funds into pet projects and their own personal bank accounts. The number eight problem, a lack of education. This is ridiculous. It's current year. We need to fix the issues with access to quality education now. Americans deserve a free education for life. Okay, people, breathe. America has more college graduates now than ever before. In the 1976-77 academic year, the number of people awarded post-secondary degrees and certificates represented just 0.79% of the national population. In 2016-17 academic year, the most recent academic year for which official figures have been released by the American government, 
Nearly 4.9 million such degrees and certificates were awarded. That's 1.5% of the current U.S. population earning post-secondary degrees in a single year, roughly three in every 200 people. Currently, about 104.5 million people in America hold post-secondary degrees and certificates, and another 46.2 million have at least some college under their belt. That's roughly three-fifths of the adult population, when in 1977 it was less than a third. There is no deficit in education per se. Rather, there is a deficit in practical, applicable degrees. The biggest shortfall in jobs falls within the trade sector, which has more than a million unoccupied positions right now and needs just a certificate to earn a good living. There's plenty of access to education, folks. And if you stop pursuing degrees in overpopulated disciplines, you will stand a much better chance of landing a job in your field after you finish your education. The number nine problem, safety, security, and well-being. This is me. I don't feel safe. There are too many fascists out there who will kill me for just being me. No one is fighting for me. America is the most dangerous place in the world. Okay, people, breathe. No one is organizing death camps for you. We used to be taught that, yes, the world is a dangerous place, but we learned how to defend ourselves. We used to know that the only guarantees in life were death and taxes, and that everything else has to be earned, not expected. We used to cooperate with one another, looking after each other instead of walking through life filled with a fear of others. For that matter, who taught you that you were owed these things? Who sheltered you so much that you never learned how to take care of yourselves, handle your own business, and gain safety, security, and well-being on your own accord? Perhaps it was your loving parents who sheltered you from the most important teaching moment in existence, failure. One has to be prepared to fail and to take risks if one wants to succeed. One has to keep going beyond endurance, never giving up, and never demanding from others what must be earned personally. And finally, the number 10 problem, a lack of economic opportunity and unemployment. Absolutely, I have college degrees, and I can't find work. I'll never pay off my student loans. Greedy business owners don't want to pay real Americans a living wage. Fight for 15. Fight for 15. Okay, people, breathe. Why did you take out tens of thousands of dollars, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars, in student loans to get your degree? What degree did you take because you enjoyed the subject without considering what market there was for people in that field? Did you think that your bachelor's degree in Eastern philosophy would equip you for a job in the business market? Did you look at how many people with sociology degrees are still looking for work commensurate with their educational attainment? No wonder that you have only found work in the same sort of job which your high school diploma permitted to you. Maybe you should have learned a little more math, if only so that you understood that doubling the minimum wage means six months at most before the cost of living rises and absorbs the minimum wage increase, and simultaneously results in far fewer minimum wage jobs being available. If you can buy roughly the same commodity for $15, and for $10, with little appreciable difference between the quality of the commodity from those two separate sources, wouldn't you pay $10? That's what all of those greedy business owners are doing when an automated solution becomes more affordable than hiring employees. Automation will win nearly every time. Now, if you've made it this far into the video, bravo! You've got some grit, sticking it out through all of that snark from just another supposed boomer. That tells me that there just might be some hope for you, after all. These problems about which your generation is so deeply concerned are real problems, but they're not as bad as you think. Now, wait a minute. You listen to my retorts, give me a chance to show you a little support, too. The global climate may not be changing exclusively due to anthropogenic causes, But it is changing, and we need to adapt. We also need to make certain that we are practicing the best stewardship of the resources we have in order to reduce the impact of human activities on the environment. A generation ago, bottled water wasn't really a thing, for example. 
Marketing convinced the world that water sold in a bottle was safer to drink and healthier. But the truth is that it's normally just tap water, bottled and sold for a hundred times the cost of getting a glass of water. Flint, Michigan, needs to fix the water supply infrastructure, but that's not quite a universal problem. Most places in the United States have perfectly safe water supplies. We need to concentrate efforts on fixing the problem spots. We also need to make certain that our solution isn't just creating more problems, like the levels of additional pollution created by mining for all of the toxic metals which go into a hybrid car's main battery, and the fact that we don't have an effective plan for recycling many of those materials when that car eventually needs to be scrapped. War is a terrible thing. I've seen it. I've experienced it. I also believe that war is sometimes a necessary evil. Most of the world would rather negotiate than fight, but some countries would just rather fight than negotiate with the rest of the world. I'm sorry that this is true, but it is. Someone has to be willing to stand up to defend against those threats. Believe it or not, military strength is an effective deterrent in most cases, just as negotiation often avoids armed conflict. But nothing, absolutely nothing, will prevent all war entirely. All that we can do is work to mitigate the risk of war whenever possible. As for inequality, while we have made great strides forward, I would caution everyone about attempting to force your personal version of equality upon the rest of the world. Nothing will remove every trace of injustice, but we can work to mitigate it. A good place to start is to stop making the perceived injustices of everyday life the central focus of one's worldview. In other words, stop looking for injustice in everything, because you will see it even where none exists. If you spend your days declaring every behavior to be problematic, then no one outside of your group of activists will listen to you when you speak out about genuine injustices. Don't get wrapped around the axle every time you meet someone who has a different perspective and or opinion on a subject. Those differences are natural and attempting to understand where others, even people who are patently wrong, got their ideas, is useful. It could provide insight in how to change their minds, and it could also help to prevent the spread of hateful ideologies. For that matter, maybe you could spend a little less time condemning people for disagreeing with you. Most of the time, you've met someone with different life experience, and you have a lot more common ground than either of you would choose to admit. You have a problem with the lack of education in the world. I've shown that this really isn't the situation in America, but you can still fix the problem you see. Educate people. Talk with them. Be the solution to the problem, not just another living, breathing air raid siren sounding the alarm. Is the government full of corruption? Absolutely. Especially President Trump? Um, no. Just no. There are over 500 elected officials in the federal government alone, and thousands if not tens of thousands more at the state and local levels. I ask you, though, if you believe that government is full of corruption, then why on earth would you want the government to intervene more in the day-to-day -day functions of your life? For the most part, the government doesn't need to intervene or interfere. The markets sort themselves out pretty well. And as for income disparity, well, the answer isn't more taxes per se. It's removing the loopholes which allow the rich to deduct away all of their tax liabilities while sheltering their profits in foreign countries. And those loopholes have been accumulating for decades. The latest round of tax reform started in 2017. It's time to finish it by correcting the errors that were made in the first round and closing all of these loopholes. Then there will be no more, they didn't pay any taxes at all, year after year by the top performing companies in America. And perhaps income disparity will tighten up a bit. It might also lower the number of high-paying, effectively overpaid jobs temporarily. So brace yourselves for that possibility, too. The point is that these problems can be solved. If you are worried about them, then change what you do first. 
Look at the impact of your actions. Take the sincerely held beliefs of others into consideration. Don't discriminate based on innate characteristics like gender, age, and skin color. Correct your own behavior first and stand as an example to others. Oh, and as for figuring out your personal problems, most of them are problems which you can solve by yourselves if you only try. For those few which you can't, perhaps you should ask your Generation X parents. After all, they have decades more experience than you do at tackling personal problems.